book one of the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> All right. Chapter four, The Bell and the Hammer. There was no doubt about the magic this time. Down and down they rushed, first through darkness and then through a mass of vague and whirling shapes that might have been almost anything. It grew lighter, then suddenly they felt as if they were standing on something solid. A moment later, everything came into focus and they were able to look about. What a queer place, said Diggory. I don't like it, said Polly with something like a shudder. What they noticed first was the light. It wasn't like sunlight, and it wasn't like electric light, or lamps, or candles, and any other light they had ever seen. It was a dull, rather red light. Not at all cheerful. It was steady and did not flicker. They were standing on a flat paved surface, and buildings rose all around them. There was no roof overhead. And... They were sort of in a they were in sort of a courtyard. The sky was extraordinarily dark, a blue that was almost black. When you had seen that sky, you wondered that there should be any light at all. It's a very it's very funny weather here, said Diggory. I wonder if we've arrived just in time for a thunderstorm or an eclipse. I don't like it, said Polly. Both of them, without quite knowing why, were talking in whispers, and though there were no reason why they should still go on hand, hand, holding hands after their jump, they didn't let go. The walls rose very high all around the courtyard. They had many great windows in them, windows without glass, though which you were which you saw nothing but black darkness lower down there were great pillared arches yawning blackly like their mouths of railway tunnels it was rather cold the stone of which everything was built seemed to be red but that might only be because of the curious light it was obviously very old Many of the flat stones that paved the courtyard had cracks across them. None of them fitted closely together, and the sharp corners were all worn off. One of the arched doorways was half filled up with rubble. The two children kept on turning round and round to look at the different sides of the courtyard. One reason that they were afraid of somebody or something looking out of the windows at them when their backs were turned. Do you think anyone lives here? said Diggory, still in a whisper. No, said Polly. It's all in ruins. We haven't heard a sound since we came. Let's stand still and listen for a bit, Diggory suggested. And there is a really nice illustration. So yeah, this is like a like, a, like, imagine a town that had been worn, like, there was a war that happened in the town, and it was, like, a base, basically, where a huge war went out. That's basically what this town looks like. And judging by the description, it kind of sounds like a town that is currently, like, in a war situation with, the, like, the way that they describe the sky and stuff. Um, kind of feels like a fire sky kind of thing where there's like it's the middle of the night but there's still like fire and smoke from bombs and stuff that's what it sounds like to me with descriptions but I mean we never got to see this movie come to life by Disney so <laughs> oh all right they stood still and listened but all they could hear was the thump thump of their own hearts this place was at least as quiet as the wood between the worlds It was a bit different kind of quietness. The silence of the wood had been rich and warm. You could almost hear the trees growing and full of life. This was dead, cold, empty silence. You couldn't imagine anything growing in it. Let's go home, said Polly. But we haven't seen anything yet, said Diggory. 
Now we're here, we simply must have a look around. I'm sure there's nothing at all interesting here. There's not much point in finding a, in a, finding a magic ring that lets you go into other worlds if you're afraid to look at them when you've got when you've got there. Who's talking about being afraid? said Polly, letting go of Diggory's hand. I only thought you didn't seem very keen on exploring this place. I'll go anywhere you go. We can get away the moment we want to, said Diggory. Let's take off our green rings and put them in our right-hand pockets. All we've got to do is remember that our yellow are in our left-hand pocket, and you can keep your hand as near your pocket as you like. But don't put it in, or you'll touch your yellow and vanish. They did this and went quietly up to one of the big arched doorways led into the side inside of the building. And when they stood on the threshold and could look in, they saw it was not so dark inside as they thought at first. It led into a vast, shadowy hall, which appeared to be empty, but not on but on the far side there was a row of pillars with arches between them, and though those arches there streamed in some more of the same tired looking light, they crossed the hall, walking very carefully for fear of holes in the floor or anything lying about that they might trip over. It seemed a long walk. When they had reached the other side, they came through the arches and found themselves in another and larger courtyard. That doesn't look very safe, said Polly, pointing at a place where the wall bulged outward and looked as if it were ready to fall over in the courtyard. In one place, a pillar was missing between two arches, and the bit that had came down to where the top of the pillar ought to have been hung there with nothing to support it. Clearly, the place had been deserted for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. If it's lasted till now, I suppose it'll last a bit longer, said Diggory, but we must be very quiet. You know, and noise sometimes brings things down, like an avalanche in the Alps. They went on out of that courtyard into another doorway and up a great flight of steps and through vast rooms that opened out of one another till you were dizzy with the mere size of the place. Every now and then they thought they were going to get out into the open and see what sort of country lay around the enormous place, but every time they only got into another courtyard. They must have been magnificent places when people were still living there. In one, in one there had once been a fountain, a great stone monster with widespread wings stood in with its mouth open and you could still see a bit of piping on the back of its mouth out of which the water used to pour under it was a wide stone basin to hold the water but it was a as dry as a bone in other places there were the dry sticks of some sort of climbing plant which had wound itself around the pillars and helped to pull some of them down, but it had died long ago, and there were no ants or spiders or any other living things you would expect to see in a ruin, and where the dry earth showed between the broken flagstones, there was no grass or moss. It was all dreary and all so much the same that even Diggory was thinking they had better put on their yellow rings and get back to the warm green living forest of the in-between place when they came to huge 
to two huge doors of some metal that might possibly be gold. One stood a little ajar, so of course they went in and looked in, but st stared back and drew a long breath, for the last, for at last there was something worth seeing. For a second they thought the room was filled of people, hundreds of people all seated and perfectly still. Polly and Diggory, as you may guess, stood perfectly still themselves. For a good long time, looking in. But present, presently they decided that they were looking at could not be real people. There was no movement nor the sound of a breath among them at all. They were like the most wonderful waxworks you had ever saw. This time, Polly took lead. There was something in the room which interested her more than it interested Diggory. All the figures were wearing magnificent clothes. If you were interested in clothes at all, you could hardly help going in to see them closer. And the blaze of the colors made this room look not exactly cheerful, but at any rate rich and majestic, after all, the dust was emptiness of the others. It had more windows, too, and was a good deal lighter. I can hardly describe the clothes. The figures were all robed and had crowns on their heads. Their robes were of crimson and silvery gray and deep purple and vivid green. And there were patterns and pictures of flowers and strange beasts and needlework all over them. Precious stones of astonishing size and brightness stared from their crowns and hung in chains round their necks and peeped out all the places where anything was fastened. Why haven't these clothes all rotted away? Long ago, asked Polly. Magic, di whispered Diggory. Can't you feel it? I bet this whole room is just stiff with the enchantments. I could feel it the moment we came in. Any one of these dresses would cost hundreds of pounds, said Polly. But Diggory was more interested in the faces, and indeed, these were well worth looking at. The people sat in their stone chairs on each side of the room, and the floor was left free down the middle. You could walk down and look at the faces in turn. They were nice people, I think, said Diggory. Polly nodded. All the faces they could see were certainly nice, but the men and women looked kind of wise, kind and wise, and they seemed to come of a handsome race. But after the children had gone a few steps down the room, they came to face that looked a little different. These were very solemn faces. You felt you would have to mind your P's and Q's. If you ever met living people who looked like that. When they had gone a little further, they found themselves among faces that didn't like this was about the middle of the room. They didn't like this was about the middle of the room. The faces here looked very strong and proud and happy, but looked cruel. A little further on, they looked crueler. Further on again, they were still cruel but no longer looked happy. They were even despairing faces, as if the people they belonged to had done dreadful things and also suffered dreadful things. The last figure of all was the most interesting, a woman, even more rich richly dressed than the others, very tall, but every figure in the room was taller than the people of the world. I mean, well, of our world. With a look of such fierceness and pride that it took your breath away. Yet she was beautiful, too. Years afterward, when he was an old man, Diggory said he had never in his life known a woman so beautiful. 
It is only fair to add that Polly always said she couldn't see anything specifically beautiful about her. This woman, as I said, was the last, but there were plenty of empty chairs beyond her, as if the room had been intended for a much larger collection of images. I do wish we knew the story that's behind all this, said Diggory. Let's go back and look at the table, at that table sort of thing in the middle of the room. The thing in the middle of the room was not exactly a table. It was a square pillar about four feet high. On it, there rose a little golden arch from which hung a little golden bell. And beside this, there lay a golden hammer to hit the bell with. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, said Diggory. There seems to be something written here, said Polly, stopping down and looking at the side of the pillar. By gum, so there is, said Diggory. But of course we shan't be able to read it. Shan't we? I'm not sure, said Polly. They both looked at it hard, and as you might have expected, the letters cut into the stone were strange. But now a great wonder happened, for as they looked, looked, though the shape of the strange letters never altered, they found that they could understand them. If only Diggory had remembered what he himself had said a few minutes ago, that this was an enchanted room. He might have guessed that the enchantment was beginning to work but he was too wild with curiosity to think about that. He was longing more and more to know what was written on the pillar, and very soon they both knew what it said, which was something like this. At least this is the sense of it, though. The poetry, when you read it there, was better. Make your choice, adventurous stranger. Strike the bell and bide the danger. Or wonder till it drives you mad, what would you, what, what would have followed if you had? No fear, said Polly. We don't want any danger. Oh, but don't you see it's no good, said Diggory. We can't get out of it now. We shall always be wondering what else would have happened if we would have struck the bell. I'm not going home to be driven mad by always thinking of that. No fear. Don't be so silly, said Polly. As if anyone would. What does it matter? What would have happened? I expected anyone who's come as far as this is bound to go on wondering till it sends them dotty. That's the magic of it, you see. I can feel it beginning to work on me already. Well, I don't, said Polly crossly, and I don't believe you do either. You're just putting it on. That's all you know, said Diggory. It's because you're a girl. Girls never want to know anything but gossip and rot about people getting engaged. You looked exactly like your uncle when you said that, said Polly. Why can't you keep it to the point, said Diggory. What we're talking about is how exactly like that man, said Polly in a very grown-up voice. But she added hastily in her real voice, And don't say I'm just like that woman, or you'll be beastly copy be a beastly copycat. I should have never dreamed of calling a kid like you a woman, said Diggory loftily. Oh, I'm a kid, am I? said Polly, who was now in real rage. Well, you needn't be bothered by having a kid with you any longer then. I'm off. I've had enough of this place, and I've had enough of you too, you beastly, stuck-up, obstinate pig! None of that, said Diggory, in a voice that's even nastier than he meant it to be. 
for he saw Polly's hand moving to her pocket to get hold of her yellow ring. I can't excuse what he did next except by saying that he was very sorry for it afterward. And so were a good many other people. Before Polly's hand reached in her pocket, he grabbed her wrist, leaning across her with his back against her chest. Then keeping her arm out of the way with his other elbow. He leaned forward and picked up the hammer and struck the golden bell. A light... A light smart tap. Then he let her go, and they fell apart, staring at each other and breathing hard. Polly was just beginning to cry, not with fear, and not because he had hurt her wrist quite badly, but with furious anger. Within two seconds, however, they had something to think about that drove their own quarrels quite out of their minds. As soon as the bell was struck, it gave out a note, a sweet note such as you might have expected, and not very loud, but instead of dying away, it went on. And as it went on, it grew louder. Before a minute had passed, it was twice as loud as it had been to begin with. It was soon so loud that children had tried to speak, but they weren't thinking of speaking now. They were just standing with their mouths open. They would have not heard one another very soon it was so loud that they could not have heard one another even by shouting and still it grew all on one note a continuous sweet sound though the sweetness had something horrible about it till all the air in the great room was throbbing with it and they could feel the stone floor trembling under their feet then at last, it began to be mixed with another sound, a vague, disastrous noise, which sounded first like a roar of a distant train, and then like a crash of a falling tree. They heard something with great weights falling. Finally, a sudden rush in thunder and a shake nearly flung them off their feet. About a quarter of the roof, on one end of the room fell in. Great blocks of monastery fell all around them. And the walls rocked. The noise of the bells stopped. The clouds of dust cleared away. Everything became quiet again. It was never found out whether the fall of the roof was due to magic or whether that unbelievably loud sound from the bell had just happened to be strike the note which was more than those crumbling walls could stand. There! I hope you're satisfied now! panted Polly. Well, it's all over anyway, said Diggory, and both thought it was. But they had never been more mistaken in their lives. And that is the end of chapter four. Ooh! <laughs> also, I disagree very much with um, the statement about how girls aren't very curious. If I was to be in a in a ruin, I would not love to look around the ruins. I love to explore that kind of stuff. So, sexist? <laughs> I don't know. This is an old book, though. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure that since the time period is really old as well, that probably the fact that Oh, sorry. My nose is, like, super itchy right now. I don't know why. Um, I'm pretty sure that since this book takes place so long ago that, of course, there are going to be some pretty, pretty harsh stereotypes in here. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. All right. We are going on to Chapter 5 now. Chapter 5. The Depor... The Depor... The deplorable word, gosh, I could, I like read it in my head multiple times and still could not say it. <laughs> oh, okay, reposition. All right. The children were facing one another across the pillar where the bell hung still. Trembling, trembling though it no longer gave out any note. Suddenly, they heard a soft noise from the end of the room, 
which was still undamaged. They turned quick as lightning to see what it was. One of the road figures, the furthest off one of all, the woman whom Diggory thought was so beautiful, was rising from its chair. When she stood up, they realized that she was even taller than they had thought. I lost my place. It, Thank you so much for the follow. Thank you for the follow, um, Coco Man. Thank you. <laughs> and you could see at once, not only from her crown and robes, but from the flash of her eyes and curve of her lips, that there was a, that she was a great queen. She looked around the room and saw the damage and saw the children, but you could not guess from her face what she thought of either, or whether she was surprised. She came forward with long, swift strides. Who has awakened me? Who has broken the spell? She asked. I think it must have been me, said Diggory. You, said the queen, laying her hand on his shoulder, a white beautiful hand but Diggory could feel that it was strong and like as steel pincers you but you are only a child a common child anyone can see at a glance that you have no drop of royal or noble blood in your veins how did such as you dare to enter this house we've come from another world by magic, said Polly, who thought it was high time the queen took some notice of her as well as Diggory. Is this true? said the queen, still looking at Diggory and not giving Polly even a glance. Yes, it is, he, said he. The queen put her other hand under his chin and forced it up so she could see his face better. Diggory tried to stare back, but soon he had to let his eyes drop. There was something about hers that overpowered him. After she had studied him for well over a minute, she let go of his chin and said, You are no magician. The mark of it is not on you. You must be only the servant of a magician. It is on another's magic that you will have traveled here. It was my uncle Andrew said Diggory. At the moment, not in the room itself, but from somewhere very close, there came a aim, first a rumbling, then a creaking, then a roar of falling masonry, and the floor shook. There is great peril here, said the queen. The, play the whole palace is breaking up. If we are not out of it in a few minutes, we shall be buried under the ruin. She spoke as calmly as if she had been merely mentioning the time of day. Come, she added and held out a hand so each of the children, Polly, who was disliking the queen and feeling rather sulky, would have not let her hand be taken if she could have helped it. But though the queen spoke so calmly, her movements were as quick as thought. Before Polly knew what was happening, her left hand had been caught in a hand so much larger and stronger than her own that she could do nothing about it. This is a terrible woman, Polly thought. She's strong enough to break my arm with one twist. And now that she's got my left hand, I can't get my yellow ring. If I tried to stretch across and get my right hand into my left pocket, I might I mightn't be able to reach it before she asked me what I was doing. Whatever happens, we mustn't let her know about the rings. I do hope Diggory has a sense to keep his mouth shut. I wish I could get a word to him alone. The queen led them out of the hall of images into a long corridor and then through a whole maze of halls and stairs and courtyards. Again and again, they heard parts of the great palace collapsing. Sometimes 
quite close to them. Once a huge arch came thundering down only a moment after they had passed through it. The queen was walking quickly, and the children had to trot to keep up with her. And she showed no sign of fear. Diggory thought, she's wonderfully brave and strong. She's what I call a queen. I do hope she's going to tell us the story of this palace. She did tell them certain things as they went along. That is the door to the dungeons, she would say, or that passage leads to the principal torture's chamber. Or, this was the old banqueting hall, where my great-grandfather blade seven hundred nobles to a feast and killed them all before they had drunk their fill. They had had rebellious thoughts. They came at last into the hall larger and loftier than they had yet seen from its size and from the great doors at the far end diggory thought that now at last they must be coming to the main entrance in this he was quite right the doors were dead black either ebony or some black metal which is not found in our world they were fastened with great bars most of them too high to reach and all too heavy to lift. He wondered how they would let get out. The queen let go of his hand and raised her arm. She drew up the full height and stood rigid. There's some, again, some pretty nice illustrations. I like the way that they drew the queen. I wonder if this is the same queen that kidnaps what's-his-face. Then she said something which they couldn't understand, but it sounded horrid and made an action as if she were throwing something toward the doors. And those high and heavy doors trembled for a second, as if they were made of silk, and then crumbled away till there was nothing left but a heap of dust on the threshold. Whoa! Whistled wig wiggery. <laughs> Diggory. Has your master magician your uncle power like mine? Asked the queen firmly seizing Diggory's hand. But I shall know later. In the meantime, remember what you have seen. This is what happens to things and people who stand in my way. Much more light than they had yet seen in that country was pouring in through the now empty doorway. And when the queen led them out through it, they were not surprised to find themselves in the open air. The wind that blew in their faces was cold, yet somehow stale. They were looking from a high terrace, and there was a great landscape spread out below them. Low down and near the horizon hung a great red sun, far bigger than our sun. Diggory felt at once that it was also older than ours, a sun near the end of its life, weary and looking down upon the world. To the left of the sun was, and higher up, there was a single star, big and bright. Those were the only two things to be seen in the dark sky. They made a dismal group and on the earth, in every direction, as far as the eye could reach, there, were va there was a spread of vast city in which there was no living thing to be seen. And all the temples, towers, place, palaces, pyramids, and bridges cast along disastrous-looking shadows in the light of the withered sun, 
Once a great river had flown through the city, but the water had long since vanished, and it was now only a width ditch of gray dust. Look well. Look well on that which no eyes will ever see again, said the queen. Such was Karn. Charn? I don't know. Charn. That great city, the city of the king of kings, the wonder of the world, perhaps all worlds. Does your great, does your uncle rule any city as great as this boy? No, said Diggory. He was going to explain that Uncle Andrew didn't rule any cities, but the queen went on. It is silent now, but I have stood here when the whole air was full of noises of carn. Charn, I don't know. I don't know what it's supposed to be pronounced as. The trampling of feet, the creaking of wheels, and the cracking of the whips, and the groaning of slaves, the thunder of chaotic, and the sacrificial drums beating in the temples. I have stood here but that was near the end, when the roar of battle went up every street and the river of Karn ran red. I keep reading it as Karn. This is C-H-A-R-N. So I think it's supposed to be Charn, but I don't know. She paused and added, All in one moment, one woman blotted it out forever. Who? said Dickory in a faint voice. And he already guessed the answer. I, said the queen, I, Jadis, the last queen, but the queen of the world. The two children stood silent, shivering in the cold wind. It was my sister's fault, said the queen. She drove me to it. May the curse of all the powers rest upon her for ever any at any moment i was ready to make peace yes to spare her life too if only she would yield to the throne but she would not her pride has destroyed the whole world even after the war had begun there was a solemn promise that neither side would use magic but she broke her promise what could i do fool as if she did not know that I had more magic than she. She even knew that I had secret. I had the secret of the deplorable word. Did she think she was always a weakling? That I would not use it? What was it? said Diggory. That was the secret of secrets, said the queen. It had long been known to great kings of our race that there was a word which, if spoken, will the prop with the proper ceremonies would destroy all living things except for the one who spoke it. But the ancient kings were weak and soft-hearted and bound themselves and all who should come after them with great oaths never even to seek after the knowledge of the word but i learned it in secret and paid a terrible price to learn it i did not use it until she forced me to i fought to overcome her by every other means i poured out the blood of my armies like water beast muttered polly the last great battle said the queen, raged for three days here in Tarn itself. For three days I looked down upon it from this very spot. I did not even, I did not use my power till the last of my soldiers had fallen, and that accursed woman, my sister, at the head of her rebels, was halfway up those great stairs that led up from the city to the terrace. Then I waited till we were so close that we could see one another's faces. She flashed her horrible, wicked eyes upon me, 
and said, Victory! Yes! Said I, Victory! But not yours! Then I spoke with a deplorable word. A moment later, I was the only living thing beneath the sun. But the people, Diggory gasped. What people, boy? asked the queen. All the ordinary people, said Polly, who'd never done you any harm. And the women, and the children, and the animals. Don't you understand? said the queen, still speaking to Diggory. I was the queen. They were all all my people what else were they for but to be to do my will it was rather hard luck on them all the same he said one second i want to check who okay the queen is the one who says the next part i had forgotten that you're only a common boy how should you understand reasons of state you must learn child that what would be wrong for you or any other common people is not wrong in a great queen such as I. The weight of the world is on our shoulders. We must be freed from all rules. Ours is a high and lonely destiny. Diggory suddenly remembered what Uncle Andrew had used exactly the same words but they sounded much grander when the queen said them. Perhaps because Uncle Andrew was not seven feet tall and dazzlingly beautiful. And what did you do then? asked Diggory. Heiss already cast strong spells on the hall where the images of my ancestors sit, and the force of the spell was that I should sleep among them like an image myself and neither food nor fire thought it would were a thousand years till one came and struck the bell and awoke me. Was it the deplorable word that make the sun like that? asked Diggory. Like what? said the queen. So big, so red, so cold. It has always been so, said the queen, at least for hundreds of thousands of years. Have you a different sort of sun in your world? Yes, it's smaller and yellower, and it gives a good more deal heat. The queen gave a long draw, ah, and Diggory saw on her face the same hungry and greedy look which he had lightly seen on Uncle Andrew's. So, she said, yours is a younger world. She paused for a moment to look once more at the deserted city and if she was sorry for all the evil she had done there. She certainly didn't show it and then said, now, let's be going. It is cold here and the end of all the ages. Going where? asked both children. Where? repeated the queen in surprise. To your world, of course. Polly and Diggory looked at each other aghast. Polly had disliked the queen from the first, and even Diggory, now that he had heard the story, felt that he had seen quite as much of her as he wanted. Certainly she was not at all the sort of person one would like to take home. And if they did, like, they didn't know how they could. What they wanted was to get away themselves, but Polly couldn't get at her ring. And of course, Diggory couldn't go without her. Diggory got very red in the face and stammered, uh, uh, Oh, our world. I, I didn't know you wanted to go there. What else were you sent here for if not to fetch me? asked the queen. I'm sure you wouldn't like our world at all, said Diggory. It's not her sort of place, is it, Polly? It's very dull. Not really worth seeing. It would soon be worth seeing when I rule it, answered the queen. But you can't, said Diggory. It's not like that. They wouldn't let you, you know. The queen gave a conception... A... A... Contempt 
contemptuous smile. I think I don't know. I think I think it's contemptuous. I don't know. Many great kings, she said, thought they could stand against the house of Charn, but they all fell, and their very names are forgotten, foolish boy. Do you think that I, with my beauty and my magic, will not have your whole world at my feet before a year has passed? Prepare your incantations and take me there at once. This is perfectly frightful, said Diggory to Polly. Perhaps you fear this for this uncle of yours, said the queen, but if he honors me duly, I shall keep his life and his throne. Wait, he shall keep his life and his throne. I am not coming to fight against him. He must be ve a very great magician if he found out how to send you here. Is he king of your whole world or only part of it? He isn't king of anywhere, said Diggory. You are lying, said the queen. Does not magic always go with the royal blood? Whoever heard of common people being magicians? I can see the truth whether you speak it or not. Your uncle is a great king and a great enchanter of your world. And by his art, he has seen the shadow of my face in some magic mirror or some enchanted pool. And some, and for the love of my beauty, he has made a potent spell which shook your world to its foundations and sent you across the vast gulf between worlds and worlds to ask for my favor and to bring me to him. Answer me. Is that not how it was? Well, not exactly, said Diggory. Not exactly, shouted Polly. Why, it's absolute bosh from beginning to end. Minions, cried the queen, churning in rage upon Polly, seizing her hair at the very top. Her head were her of her head where it hurts most but in so d doing let go of both the children's hands now shouted diggory and quick shouted polly they plunged their left hands into their pockets they did not even need to put the rings on the moment they touched them the whole of the of that dreary world vanished from their eyes they were rushing upward and a warm green light was growing near overhead. And that is the end of chapter five. I thought it was the actual nephew who was the magician. Nope. Nope. That's why it's called the magician's nephew instead of the nephew who was a magician. I think that would actually be a terrible name. Um, he's not even an apprentice either. He just got screwed over basically. And that's how he got here. Um, yeah, he basically just got screwed over. I kind of wonder if this is the queen that's on the front of it and if she's going to keep coming back into the into the story. Doo -doo -doo. I'm like glancing through the book to see if I see her name again. Yeah, I don't see her name again, so I don't think she's going to pop back up. I mean. All right. Chapter 6. The Beginning of Uncle Andrew's Troubles. Let go, let go, let go, screamed Polly. I'm not touching you, said Diggory. Then their heads came out of the pool, and once more the sunny quietness of the wood between the worlds was about them and it was it seemed richer and warmer and more peaceful than ever after the staleness and ruin of the palace they had just left i think that if they had been given the chance they would again have forgotten who they were and where they came from and would have lain down and enjoyed themselves 
half asleep listening to the growing of the trees. But this time, there was something that kept them as wide awake as possible. For as soon as they got out on the grass, they found that they were not alone. The queen, or the witch, whichever you like to call her, had come up with them, holding on fast by Polly's hair. That was why Polly had been shouting out, let go. This proved, by the way, another thing about the rings, which Uncle Andrew hadn't told Diggory because he didn't know it himself. In order to jump from world to world by using one of those rings, you don't need to be wearing or touching it yourself. It is enough if you are touching someone who is touching it. In that way, they work like a magnet. And everyone knows that if you pick up a pin with a magnet and other pins, which is touching it, the first pin will come too. Now that you saw her in the wood, the queen looked very different. She was much paler than she had been, so pale that hardly any of her beauty was left. And she was stooped and seemed to be finding it hard to breathe, as if the air of the place stifled her. Neither of the children felt in the least afraid of her now. Let go of my hair, said Polly. What do you mean by it? Here, let go of her hair at once, said Diggory. They both turned and struggled with her, they were stronger than she, and in a few seconds they had forced her to let go. She reeled back, panting, and there was a look of terror in her eyes. Quick, Diggory, change rings into the home pool! Help! Help! Mercy! cried the witch in a faint voice, staggering after them. Take me with you! You cannot mean to leave me into this horrible place! It's killing me! It's a reason of state, said Polly spitefully. Like when you killed all those people for your own, from your own world. Be quick. Do be quick, Diggory. They put on the green rings, but Diggory said, Oh, Potter, what are we to do? He couldn't help feeling a little sorry for the queen. Oh, don't be such an ass, said Polly. Ten to one, she's only sham shamming. Do come on. And then both children plunged into the home pool. It's a good thing we made that mark, thought Polly. But as they did jump, Diggory felt the cold large felt the large cold finger and thumb had caught him by the ear, and they sank down and the confused shapes of our own world began to appear. The grip of the finger and the thumb grew stronger. The witch was apparently recovering her strength. Diggory struggled and kicked, but it was not of the least of use. In a moment, they found themselves in Uncle Andrew's study, and there was Uncle Andrew himself, staring at the wonderful creature that Diggory had brought back from beyond that world. And while he might stare, Diggory and Polly stared too. There was no doubt that the witch had gone, had got over her faintness. And now was the one saw, that saw her room in our world. With ordinary things around her, she fairly took one breath, one's breath away. In Charn, she had been alarming enough. In London, she was terrifying. For one thing, there had they had not realized till now how very big she was. Hardly human was what Diggory thought when he looked at her, and he may have been right, for some say there is giant blood in the royal family of Charn. And even her height was nothing compared with her beauty her fierceness, and her wildness. She looked ten times more alive 
than most of the people one meets in London. Uncle Andrew was bowing and rubbing his hands and looking, to tell the truth, extremely frightened. He seemed a little shrimp of a creature beside the witch, and yet, as Polly said afterward, there was a sort of likeness between her face and his. Something in the expression. It was, it was the look that all wicked magicians have, the mark which the queen had said she could not find on Diggory's face. One good thing about seeing the two together was that you would never again be afraid of Uncle Andrew any more than he would have been afraid of a worm after you had met a rattlesnake or after a cow you had met a mad bull. Whew! thought Diggory to himself. Him? A magician? Not much. Now she's, now she's the real thing. Uncle Andrew kept on rubbing his hands and bowing. He was trying to say something very polite, but his mouth had gone all dry so that he could not speak his experiment with the ring. He had, as he had called it, was turning out more successful than he had liked. For though he dabbled in magic for years, he always loved all the dangers as far as he as one could to other people. Nothing at all like this had ever happened to him before. The queen spoke, not very loud, but there was something in her voice that made the whole room quiver. Where is the magician who has called me into this world? Uh, uh madame, gasped Uncle Andrew. I, I am most honored, highly gratified, and most unexpected pleasure. If only I had the opportunity of making any preparations. I, 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 where is the magician fool, said the queen. I, I am madame. I hope you will excuse any er, er, liberties these naughty children may have taken. I, I assure you, there was no intention. You, said the queen in a still more terrible voice than in one stride, she crossed the room, seized great uncle Andrews by, the, by his hair and pulled his head back so as to look up, look at his face. Then she studied his face as she had studied Diggory's face in the place of, of Charn. He blinked and licked his lips nervously at the time. At last she let go of him. So suddenly he reeled back against the wall. I see, she said scornfully. You are a magician of sort. Stand up, dog. Don't sprawl there as if you were Speaking to your equals? How do you come to know magic? You are not of royal blood, I swear. Well, uh, n not perhaps in the strict sense, stammered Uncle Andrew. Not exactly royal, ma'am. The Ketterleys are, however, I mean very old family, an old Dorsetshire family, ma'am. Peace, said the witch. I see what you are. You are a little peddling magician who works by rules and books. There is no real magic in your blood and heart. Your kind was made an end of in my world a thousand years ago. But here I shall allow you to be my servant. I, I should be most happy and delighted to be of your service a, a pleasure i assure you peace you talk far too much listen to your first task i see we are in a large city procure for me at once a chariot or a flying carpet or a well-trained dragon of whatever it's usual for royal noble persons in your land then bring me to places where you can get clothes and jewels and slaves fit for my rank. Tomorrow I will begin the conquest of the world. Uh, uh, 
I'll go and order a cab at once, gasped um, Uncle Andrew. Stop, said the witch, just as he reached the door. Do not dream of treachery. My eyes can see through walls and into the minds of men. They will be on your be on you wherever you go. At the first sign of disobedience, I will lay such spell on you that anything you sit down on will feel like red-hot iron. And whenever you lie in bed, there will be invisible box of ice at your feet. Now go. The old man went out looking at the dog with its looking like a dog with its tail between its legs. The children were now afraid that the queen would have something to say to them about what had happened in the wood. As it turned out, however, she never mentioned it either. Then or afterward, I think, and Diggory thinks too, that her mind was sort of which cannot remember that quiet place at all. And however often you took her there, and however long you left her there, she would still know nothing about it. Now that she was left alone with the children, she took no notice to either of them. And that was like her too. In charn, she had taken no notice of Polly till the very end, because Diggory was the one she wanted to make use of. Now she had Uncle Andrew, so took no notice of Diggory. I expect most witches are like that. They are not interested in things or people unless they can use them. They are terribly pra practical. So there was silence in the room for a minute or two. But you could tell by the way the queen tapped on her foot on the floor that she was growing impatient. Presently, she said, as if to herself, What is that old fool doing? I should have brought a whip. She stalked out of the room in pursuit of Uncle Andrew without a glance at the children. Whew, said Polly, letting out a long breath of relief. And now I must get home. It's frightfully late. I shall catch it. Well, do do come back as soon as you can, said Diggory. This is simply ghastly having her here. We must make some sort of plan. That's up to your uncle now, said Polly. It was he who started all this messing about with magic. All the same, you will come back, won't you? Hang it all, you can't leave me alone in this scrape like this. I shall go home by the tunnel, said Polly rather coldly. That'll be the quickest way. And if you want me to come back, hadn't you better say you're sorry? Sorry, exclaimed Diggory. Well, now, if that isn't just like a girl, what have I done? Oh, nothing, of course, said Polly sarcastically. Only merely screwed my wrist off in that room with the wax works, like you cowardly bully. Only struck the bell with the hammer like a silly idiot only turned back in the woods so that she had the time to catch hold of you before we jumped into our own pool. That's all. Oh, said Diggory, very surprised. Well, all right. I'll say I'm sorry. And I'm really sorry about what happened in the wax room. There, I said I'm sorry. And now, do be decent and come back. I shall be in a frightful hole if you don't. I don't see what's going to happen to you. It's Mr. Cutterly who's going to sit on red-hot chairs and have ice in his bed, isn't it? It isn't that sort of thing, said Diggory. What I am bothered about is Mother. Suppose that creature went into her room. She might frighten her to death. Oh, I see, said Polly in a rather different voice. All right, we'll call it Pax. I'll come back if I can, but I must go now. And she crawled through the little door into the tunnel, and that was a dark place among the rafters, 
which had seemed so exciting and adventurous a few hours ago, seemed quite tame and home now. We must go back to Uncle Andrew. His poor old heart went pit a pat when he staggered down the attic stairs and kept on dabbing at his forehead with a handkerchief. When he reached his bedroom, which was a floor below, he locked himself in, and the very first thing he did was grope his wardrobe for a bottle of wine and a glass, which he always kept hidden there, where Aunt Letty could not find them. He poured himself out a glass of some nasty grown-up drink and drank it off all at one gulp. Then he drew a deep breath. Upon my word, he said to himself, I'm dreadfully shaken, most upsetting, and at my time of life. He poured out a second glass and drank it too. Then he began to change his clothes. You have never seen such clothes, but I can remember them. He put on a very high, shiny, stiff collar of the sort you made your hold your chin up all the time. He put on a white waistcoat with a pattern on it, arranged his gold watch chain across the front. He put on his best frock coat, the one he kept for weddings and funerals. He got out his best tall hat and polished it up. There was a vase of flowers put there by Aunt Letty on his dressing room table. He took one and put it in his buttonhole. He took a clean handkerchief, a lovely one, such as you couldn't buy today, out of the little left-hand drawer and put a few drops of scent on it. He took his eyeglass with the thick black ribbon and screwed it onto his eye, and he looked at himself in the mirror. Children have no idea... Children have one kind of silliness, as you know, and grown-ups have another kind. At this moment, Uncle Andrew was be beginning to be silly in a very grown-up way. Now that the witch was no longer in the same room with him, he was quickly forgetting how she had frightened him and thinking more and more of her wonderful beauty. He kept on saying to himself, A dem fine woman, sir, a dem fine woman, a superb creature. He had also somehow managed to forget that it was the children who had got hold of this superb creature. He felt as if himself, by his magic, had called her out of the unknown world. Andrew, my boy, he said to himself as he looked in the glass. You're a devilish well-preserved fellow for your age, a distinguished-looking man. You see, the foolish old man was actually beginning to imagine the witch would fall in love with him. The two drinks probably had something to do with it, and so had his best clothes. But he was, in any case, as vain as a peacock. There was... That was why he become a magician. Macaron, please don't call the bed sheet. Thank you. He looked at the door, went downstairs, sent the housemaid out to fetch a handsome, everyone has lots of servants in those days, and looked into the drawing room. There, as he expected, he found Aunt Letty. She was busily mending a, a mattress. It lay on the floor near the window, and she was kneeling on it. Oh, Letia, my dear, said Uncle Andrew, I, uh have to go out just lend me five pounds or so there's a good gel gel was the way he pronounced girl oh so he, he meant gal instead of girl okay so he was saying gal instead of girl <laughs> no andrew dear said aunt letty in her firm quiet voice without looking up from her work I've told you times without number that I will not lend you money. Now pray don't be troublesome, my dear gal, 
said Uncle Andrew. It's most important you will put me in a decadently awkward position if you don't. Andrew, said Aunt Letty, looking at him straight in the face, I wonder you are not ashamed to ask me for money. There was a long, dull story of a grown-up kind behind these words. All you need to know about is that Uncle Andrew, what with managing Dear Aunt Letty's business matters for her, and never doing any work, and running up large bills for brandy and cigars, which Aunt Letty had paid for again and again, had made her a good deal poorer than she had been in 30 years. My dear Gil, said Uncle Andrew, don't you understand? I shall have, I've, I shall have some quite unexpected expenses today. I have to do a little entertaining. Come now, don't be tiresome. And who, pray, are you going to entertain, Andrew? Asked Aunt Letty. A, a most distinguished visitor has just arrived. Distinguished? Distinguished? Fiddlestick, said Aunt Letty. There hasn't been a ring at the bell for the last hour. At the moment the door was suddenly flung open, Aunt Letty looked round and saw with amazement that an enormous woman, splendidly dressed with bare arms and flashing eyes, stood in the doorway. It was the witch. And that is the end of chapter six. All right, guys. How do you feel about the book so far? So, I don't understand. I didn't see her name anywhere else in the book, but maybe it's because they stopped calling her by her name. Like, they keep, like, changing it to this, between witch and queen and then her actual name, which I haven't been saying her actual name because I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Um, so, I have no idea if she, like, sticks around to the entire story or what. Oh, Aslan does appear in this book, though. Ha ha ha, we have Aslan.